Hello, everybody. We are just going to get going here right away. Uh, if you have any questions or anything, feel free to direct those into the Q&A section of uh, the Zoom, and we'll pass those on up to the presenters, OK? And I'm going to hand it on over to Amy. Thank you, Peter. Hello, everyone. Thank you all for joining us today. We see people are still logging on, so welcome. Today, we have our Community Action Agencies Advancing Family, Social, and Economic Mobility Through Whole Family Approach resource webinar. So thank you all for joining us. And as we kick off, we want to go ahead and do a land acknowledgement. So for me, this land, this meeting is being held on the traditional lands of the Piscataway people. And I pay my respect to elders, both past and present, who have stewarded this land throughout generations. So if you would like to deliver your statement in the chat, including the land and the people that you were occupying during the session, you can do so now. And I will go ahead and put that in the chat. as we move on, we'll continue with the community action promise. Community action changes people's lives, embodies the spirit of hope, improves communities, and makes America a better place to live. We care about the entire community, and we are dedicated to helping people help themselves and each other. So here are our presenters for today. We have Jeannie Chaffin, Special Advisor for Whole Family Approach. Tiffany Day, Director for Whole Family Approach Innovations, myself, Amy Roberge, Senior Associate for Learning and Dissemination, and Peter Coyne, Program Associate for Communications and Dissemination. And so now as we kick us off, we just want to get a sense of where you all are at as far as your, your understanding with Whole Family Approach. And so we're going to start off with a mentee. And some of you may have used this before, some of you may not. So I'm going to put a link in the chat. So if you click on that link, you will see a few questions. And team, you may need to put that in the chat a few times if others miss it. But I will go ahead and share my screen. So once you all see the Menti link, on a scale of one to five, how familiar are you with the whole family approach? And you're also welcome to put things in the chat if you're unable to use the Menti. Does it seem to be working okay for folks? Just a reminder, everybody, to use the Menti link in the uh, in the chat, not to use the chat feature on Zoom itself. Yeah, we may need to put the link again if maybe others missed it. Looks like we have some good response in the chat. So we have a lot of threes, some twos, five. All right, some fives. Thank you all for using the chat. Sorry for the technical difficulties. We can go ahead to the next question. And what are you hoping to learn from this webinar? Okay, looks like the mentee isn't working. Well, that's fine. You can go ahead and just keep using the chat. Okay, we have some saying anything about whole family approach what whole family approach is and how it relates to housing, anything about how to better serve entire families. Okay, 
now you all should be able to see this. Thank you all for the feedback. And we'll save this as well. All right, so with that, I'll pass it to Tiffany Day to keep us going. Thank you all for continuing to put your feedback in the chat. Thanks so much, Amy and Peter, and hello, um, Community Action family. Uh, my name is Tiffany Day again, and I have the pleasure of serving as Director of uh, Whole Family Approach Innovations here at the Partnership. And so we're going to start. Um, Jeannie and I are actually going to tag team this, so I have the, the fun opportunity to be able to work with her in this uh, space as well. And so we're going to start with just some grounding in the background um, and history of the two-generation approach, including the why, uh, some of the core components of that, uh, guiding principles, as well as some challenges and barriers um, that have been surfaced by uh, the field in terms of how this work is um, being implemented across the country. So starting with this slide, um, again, as we dive into the how-to of Tujin implementation, it is important to take um, you know, a minute to highlight the rationale for Tujin. Uh, so the Tujin approach is backed by years of research, planning, implementation, um, and evidence, quite frankly. Uh, so research indicates that investing in um, quality early childhood yields a 14% annual return on investment later in life. And so furthermore, a 17% increase in adult earnings is realized for these children with just a $3,000 investment during early childhood. And then another uh, key research point that we like to um, you know, really hit on is that you know, we've shown and, and we've known and evidence has shown um, the changes in the brain um, that occur in a young child in a young child's brain as well as um, in their parents' brains as the, the child develops. But the latest uh, research also indicates the shifts in the brains of caregivers in general, not just the parent um, or the individual carrying the child. And so this accounts for that parental instinct that develops and strengthens over time. And so we always want to ground in the data, uh, ground in the research. So, you know, let's talk a little bit more about Tujin and the history. And so I'd like to cite Ascend at the Aspen Institute, which is an open source um, national hub for all things Tujin. Um, and so the Tujin approach actually, um, it recognizes family as fundamental to human development. And this intuitive link between individual and collective success um, has long been recognized by indigenous communities in the US and around the globe. Uh, but supporting the entire family unit uh, wasn't really employed as a formal federal strategy um, until, um, you know, in the, in the human services se sector, especially until the late 19th century. And so some of the earlier models, of course, include settlement houses and Head Start. So we know Head Start was one of the first uh, U.S. models of the two-gen whole family approach. And so the term two-gen actually was coined in the late 1980s by the Foundation for Child Development to reflect programs that were emerging across the country. Um, however, there were some significant lessons learned uh, during the 1.0 phase of 2Gen. And so those were, you know, the, the fact that intentional service integration was critical, uh, that the quality of the services mattered, the intensity and the duration of those services mattered, who was targeted, um, in that, um, in those services mattered, and then also how how you work with families was really crucial. So again, those are some of the earlier lessons, um, you know, that have really helped to inform what Two Gen Two Point and Whole Family are. Next slide, please. So again, lessons from uh, 1.0 uh, of 2Gen informed the 2Gen two, two, uh, 2 2.0 and the guiding principles of the approach. And so as the 2Gen movement gains momentum, it is even more important to ensure fidelity to the two-generation approach by adhering to these five guiding principles. So the first one is we wanna make sure we're always measuring and accounting for outcomes for children and the adults in their lives simultaneously. In order to do this, we have to look at outcomes and systems to ensure alignment with the two-generation approach. And we'll talk more about two-gen logic models. Um, we'll talk more about the core components um, here shortly. 
Uh, next, we want to ensure that we're engaging and listening to the voices of families. So as we all know, it's important to amplify the voices of families and communities, understanding that they are the experts in their own lives. Um, so we've heard the expression of policymakers and of practitioners about making decisions about families without families. And so this is not an option in this case if you want to ensure fidelity to the approach. And so in order to come with real effective solutions, we must partner with families, um, building on their individual and collective strengths and expertise. The third core component, I'm sorry, third um, guiding principle is uh, related to um, ensuring equity. So here, you know, it's important to be honest about the who, the what's, the why's of policy um, and do the work to ensure equitable approaches to serving um, individuals and families are, are at play. And so oftentimes we look at, you know, systems and policies as though they created themselves and that's just not the case. So it's important for us to do the work and ask the hard questions about, you know, how and why certain policies were created, whether they disproportionately impact and marginalize um, certain groups, um, or if they are achieving the results that they set out to, and if families are better off because of them. Um, and to the extent that families are not better off, we have some significant changes to make um, within these systems. Uh, the fourth guiding principle is fostering innovation and evidence together. And so here it's going to be important for us to share and learn from one another uh, by lifting up proof points and pain points that come with doing this work. And so, um, you know, it's important for us to learn together. Uh, we're one field in the whole family space, the whole family two gen space. And so learning from one another is essential. And then the last guiding principle is aligning and linking systems and funding streams. And so here, you know, there's often a misconception that taking a two gen or whole family approach requires a new program or new funding streams, when in actuality, um, you know, additional funding is helpful um, always. And new programming is sometimes necessary to fill gaps. But taking the two-gen approach and a whole family approach actually requires a shift in thinking and a focus on optimizing existing programs and services. And so this means that, you know, we must find the opportunities for collaboration, for blending and braiding existing funding streams, and identifying linkages to more effectively partner with families on their journey toward upward economic mobility. So next slide, please. So we now have some visuals um, to kind of put into focus or bring into focus some of the uh, concepts um, that I've, I've just referenced. And so, um, as you can see at the top, this illustration, um, it helps to frame our thinking around two gen. Um, it's important to remember two generation approaches provide um, opportunities for and meet the needs of children and the adults in their lives together. And so you'll hear me use two gen, you'll hear me use whole family, they are the same thing, okay? Um, I think that it's very important to really hone in on that because there's debate in the field on what you should call it. In actuality, um, what you call it should actually re reflect the needs um, and the voices of families and community. As long as you're adhering to those core components and those guiding principles, that is where the fidelity lies in this model, not in what you call it. So I just do wanna take a moment and emphasize that. And so agencies, as you can see again on this top illustration, agencies who are working toward a whole family approach that might be pro uh, providing services to children, you know, likely early childhood development programs, Head Start, Child Literacy, um, are really encouraged to revisit their service delivery um, and philosophy to intentionally incorporate services and supports that also serve parents or adults which include child care subsidies, food assistance programs, family literacy um, supports, and all of this in an effort to increase the overall impact to the family. So, you know, if you're starting on the far uh, left end, child focus, you want to gradually, in, you know, find ways to um, incorporate or integrate parent-focused services to meet somewhere in the middle. And the same goes for the parent-focused side. You want to find opportunities to incorporate supports for children um, so that you're meeting that family in the middle, um, the whole family. So now we're going to focus on the bottom half of this um, slide. And so the two-gen approach also it builds on six core components of education. This includes both early childhood and K through 12 systems, economic assets, social capital, and health and well-being to create a legacy of economic security that passes from one generation to the next. And so I want to hit on this first cog. 
um, early childhood education, which you know is investing in quality early childhood development, we know that this is very imperative. What we know about brain development is that the first open window occurs between the ages of one and three. And so ensuring that children have access to consistent quality learning has significant impacts on the trajectory of them as learners and earners later in life. Um, so we know that it's, it's very important to, to make this investment. Um, I'll, I'll add that investing in early childhood development systems includes infrastructure, quality standards, compensation, um, you know, among other things, as these are the enabling conditions needed to ensure safety, well-being, and high-quality learning. Um, so we know that the already delicate early childhood system has only been crippled further um, due to the pandemic, leaving caregivers and children in need of these supports. And so Head Start is crucial. It's a crucial um, two-gen whole family program um, to really get at this. The next um, cog that I want to focus on is the social capital. Uh, this is known as the secret sauce. And so see, social capital is really about creating spaces and opportunities for families to leverage resources in their respective communities through relationships and peer-to-peer -peer supports. So these are those informal connections, but to the extent that um, practitioners and agencies are able to intentionally create those spaces and that synergy for families is really, really important um, because you know, uh, poverty is the extent to which one goes without resources, not necessarily always tied to finances. And so when you can have that social capital, it can sometimes offset the impacts of uh, the financial, lack of financial resources. The next cog I wanna hit on is the post-secondary and employment uh, opportunities. So this is not solely limited to post-secondary institutions. This also includes vocational training and other pathways to meaningful careers and gainful um, employment where folks can uh, grow and thrive. The next one is um, economic assets. So this includes access to services and supports to increase financial assets, to build financial capacity and opportunities for generational wealth, um, home ownership, decrease in debt, wealth management, among others. The health and well-being component um, includes physical, mental, and emotional well-being. And so these supports aim to increase access to health care insurance, provide mental health services, uh, such as counseling, early intervention services for children, as well as trauma-informed care. So really addressing the impacts of adverse, adverse childhood experiences and taking a trauma-informed approach is critically important. And then lastly, want to hit on the K-12 system. Um, this is the most recent COG, I believe, was added in the last two years. And so understanding that um, kindergarten readiness, literacy, you know, quality education, um, and supports um, for students that are needed for successful matriculation of school-age children and on ramps to post-secondary pursuits. And so really thinking about the entire continuum from birth onward, right? Um, of what are the supports that are needed to ensure children and the adults have what they need? Um, what are those connections within the school systems where parents can be engaged, um, you know, in the learning process and, and, and that sort of thing. So wanna hit on those. So I will close by saying, um, you know, the traditional entry points like quality early childhood education for children and post-secondary education and employment pathways for parents are central to the approaches um, that move the whole family forward. However, any of these cogs, the idea is because they're cogs is because when you, when you turn one, it naturally kind of starts to turn the other or at least creates the opportunity for the turning of the others. And so just wanna encourage you all to look for those opportunities in your day to day. And um, we'll now kind of transition into some of the key hallmarks of the two gen whole family approach and some of the resources. And I'll pass it to Jeannie for that. Thank you. Thank you, Tiffany. I love the visual that you ended there with, like moving one cog helps the others to get rolling. And then the faster you go in one, the more you may be able to advance in the other. So I think that's a great, a great visual for us to think about. And I might just sort of also use that as, a, as an opportunity to say, I think community action agencies are just uniquely positioned to work in each of these areas. We, we know that in our community action agencies, we often have 
uh, initiatives around early childhood, post-secondary education, health and well-being. And, you know, the original language of 1964 that created community action agencies said that the purpose of a community action agency is to coordinate resources to have the maximum impact on poverty possible. So it's kind of in community action agencies DNA to coordinate all these different kinds of services and supports for families. And you might be saying, hey, National Community Action Partnership, we do that every day. And uh, we know that you do. But what's kind of unique, and this sort of gets into the hallmarks of uh, two gen or whole family is really, really doing that for children and parents or their caretakers, however they just define their family, uh, doing it together at the same time. So often we may have, um, you know, adults or, or workers in a training program but we're not really doing anything to maximize the development and the future of their children. Or sometimes we have children in a Head Start program, for example, and maybe the parents are getting a little bit of support, but not at the intensity or the level that they really need to advance towards a family supported uh, wage or job or the training. And that's where these hallmarks come in. If you look at the very last uh, two hallmarks, I'm going to start at the bottom there um, because there may be two of the most critical. Uh, a hallmark of a two-gen whole family uh, initiative, approach, program, mindset, uh, whatever level you want to look at, which is another webinar that we could do, uh, a hallmark is providing high quality services. So the services for parents, the services for children, they have to be high quality. And, and the last one there, a sufficient intensity duration, duration dosage to enable families to achieve social and economic mobility. So what this is saying is when we coordinate supports and services for parents and children, they have to be of a, a sufficient time. You know, it, nobody uh, moves up the economic ladder in a month or two. It takes a little bit of time. Um, it takes uh, some intensity. The service cannot be a light touch service if we're really trying uh, to help people fulfill their full potential and meet their goals. When you think about Head Start again, you know, that's a very intensive high dosage, high duration intervention for children. And so it really does lend itself to part of the a whole family approach. But in an agency where maybe you're going to build on Head Start, you have to really think about how do we increase the intensity, the dosage, the duration of our parent interventions so that they're as high quality and as effective as our, our child component. And then in the spirit of whole family, you know, Head Start is, is maybe zero to five, but what about children that are maybe seven or eight? Or what about families that have teenagers? What are we going to do um, to come alongside them in some of these core components? So serving parents and children, children of all ages in the family together. Uh, and then uh, Tiffany did a great job of calling out a few of the core principles, which are kind of interspersed into some of these hallmarks, like um, centering and equity and um, measuring results. And, you know, another one that's here that's important to point out is developing partnerships. No one agency ever provides all the things that are listed there in the core components. You need, may need to partner with a mental health provider or partner with a community college um, to beef up uh, some of these areas. And then I think it's, it's worth, um, noting we have incorporate coaching and really a coaching mindset is really being driven by the family's needs. And somebody even put that in our chat, driven, uh, putting the family in the driver's seat. And that's, that's really central to coaching. And Amy and Peter are going to talk about some resources we have 
uh, in a minute about coaching. But one of the things about coaching is, is that you really work with the family to create a plan. And you look at these core components and you talk to families, you uh, assess and, and see where families want to set goals. And, you know, families may not have goals in every one of these areas. You know, uh, uh, maybe, maybe a family, maybe mom and dad have some good education. And so they, you know, it's not so much that we need to come alongside them with education, but we need to really focus on economic assets uh, some social capital and, you know, a better job. So every family's mix of services needs to be customized to sort of meet their needs. And the core components help you think about all the possible areas, um, but every family is going to have their unique mix, right? Um, so sort of figuring out how we, uh, how we adjust for that is, is really important. So the, we could delve into these harm, hallmarks a little bit uh, deeper if we had more time, but you can kind of look at those and you'll get uh, this presentation and, and you can examine those. And we're, we want to save time for resources that we have that you can delve deeper into some of these things. But let me flag the next item, which are our whole family building blocks. And I'm going to talk in a minute about some of the learning communities and the peer learning that the partnership has available. If you wouldn't mind uh, advancing the slide to the next slide. Thank you. Uh, so whole family approach building blocks. So the, community, the National Community Action Partnership has been working with a number of community action agencies around the country really since 2015 on shifting to a whole family approach. And as they have been doing that, they've been developed these building blocks, which are sort of like, what do community action agencies need to um, consider and develop as they are moving to a whole family approach? And so uh, there are certain things like building and using leadership aligning services for parents and children, engaging family voice, uh, parent and child service integration. Each one of these areas is an area that we think community action agencies need to attend to in order to advance their whole family approach. And you've got some examples. If we were deconstructing each one of these building blocks, what might we, what might be inside the building blocks. And so, you know, attending and using leadership might sort of map back to developing a theory of change and a logic model about what you're trying to achieve with your whole family approach. When we look at parent and child service integration, we might see things like uh, consolidating uh, universal intake processes or coordinating uh, family and staff plans so that, you know, families don't have multiple plans across multiple workers or co-locating services. So it's not necessarily the case that your whole family two-gen approach or program has to have every one of these things, but these are examples of things that you should perhaps consider. And often, you know, some mix of, of these items here will be part of a two-gen whole family approach. And, and again, especially when we're thinking about community action agencies. So I mentioned that these building blocks were created by the partnership as part of their work with other community action agencies. And I know we have hundreds and hundreds of staff on the webinar today from community action agencies. And so let me just mention you know, what the partnership has been up to over the last several years to help sort of figure out how to support agencies, because it's led to the development of a lot of resources that I think will help you um, as you move forward in your thinking. So if you look at the next slide, it we've got, uh, oh, well, let me just call out, we're going to talk more about these items in a minute. We've got uh, a design plan resource and a resource guide around these building blocks that help agencies think through what they're trying to achieve with the whole family approach. And 
the design plan is really important because, you know, sometimes we think, oh, okay, well, we're going to implement a whole family approach at our agency, but really thinking about why, why you want to do that, what you are really trying to achieve for families in your community so that um, you can really hone in on you know, the tasks, the goals, um, the, your particular approach is important. And the design plan helps you do that. And the building blocks resource guide will give you detail about each one of those building blocks I mentioned. And both of those documents uh, have been developed in partnership with community action agencies around the country. And on the map, uh, on our next slide, we sort of call out where we have been doing whole family approach, um, communities of practice, sort of helping community action agencies learn about whole family to gen as peers. And you see a lot of little golden yellow dots there in Virginia. The partnership has been supporting a, a pilot in Virginia of six community action agencies that are adopting a whole family approach, sort of piloting some efforts there to use coaches to support families. And that is funded by the Virginia Department of Social Services with TANF money that the Virginia legislature allocated to support those six pilots. And so it's been very, very intensive learning on coaching, on designing whole family approaches uh, inside community action agencies and with partners. And then there uh, is a regional whole family approach that includes uh, several Minnesota agencies, uh, Montana, Washington, Kentucky, that is uh, working on theories of change and logic models uh, to adopt whole family approaches. Uh, inside community action agencies and with um, tribal governments. And so that's been underway for a little while. And um, prior to that, there was a 10 site uh, community of practice with agencies around the country that really did a lot of learning. And we're going to show you some resources from that that are available to you to sort of as case studies to help you think uh, about how you might uh, proceed with two gen whole family. We also have what we call the impact COP, which is really looking at the whole ecosystem in a community and thinking about how it moves social and economic mobility, perhaps through whole family approaches, but maybe through some other um, work also. So this learning that the community action agency network, you know, not just the national partnership, but the entire network is on, it's been a, a journey for many agencies. And even through the pandemic, we've seen a lot of agencies continue uh, to shift their, uh, their work to much more intensive support for parents and children together. So with that, I'm going to pass this over to Peter and Amy to talk more about where you can find some of these resources uh, and where you, you know, might make some steps forward in your agency. So Amy and Peter, uh, it's your, your, your voice now. Thank you. All right. All of these resources to you in a follow-up email as well with many of the other things that have been presented within this presentation so as uh, Jeannie touched on uh, while she was presenting we do have the whole family approach design briefs uh, I'm sorry design plan and the building block resources and these are really to help ground your agencies and how they might approach whole family approach to make it as efficient and as effective as possible uh, after that we also have our whole family approach institute that we are hoping to hold uh sometime soon uh if you'd like to look more into the agenda for that we are going to be sending out a link for that as well uh and you can go through the website here too they'll have the whole agenda the overview time zones everything you need in order to get ready for that next we have our one pager for the whole family approach so if you're looking to just give anybody in your agency or your staff a quick overview of what whole family approach is about this is excellent resource. We have our whole family approach design brief, so we specifically look at programs throughout the country that have been very successful at implementing the whole family approach. 
uh, and then we are soon to have a whole family approach design video, which that is TBD right now. We are working on that, but I assure you it's going to be Oscar worthy. And then finally, we have our Community Action Academy, as always, which has tons and tons of resources, including on whole family approach and a variety of other topics as well. And then just uh, some follow up resources. These are some outside resources that we think are really, really helpful. And many of these are going to be coming from the Aspen Institute as well. And these will all be included within the follow up email. And then we have a introduction to the human service value curve, which we think is really, really tied into this work and a big connection. If you haven't already learned about the human service value curve from many of our other trainings and introductions, uh, you should attend one of these sessions, only one. These are both going to be the exact same session, so no need to attend both, just one or the other. And then we will soon have our health intersections convening in May. Uh, you should register for that now. It's going to be coordinated uh, through the help of one of our subject matter experts, Ms. Uh, Dr. Dana Long. Uh, and we are going to be bringing in people to help train us all in triads, which is trauma and resilience informed inquiry for adversity, distress, and strength as a way to address adverse childhood experiences and our service delivery. And we're just going to pass it on for questions. And so I will turn it right back over to Tiffany. Thank you, Peter. Thank you very much. So Peter just gave you all a quick rundown of the plethora of resources um, that we have related to whole family approach. And so um, thank you for that, Peter. Uh, it was a lot to cover, so appreciate that. I want to pause just for questions on any of the content we've shared thus far. Um, and also, you know, to answer any questions related to some of the resources uh, that we just went over. I see Jeannie placed in the chat. Um, I want to give her an opportunity to talk more about that family center coaching uh, training or module in Moodle. Thank you. Yeah. So approaching the work with the coaching mindset is real is different than case management, really. Um, coaching really seeks to build capacities in individuals so that they can solve their own problems down the road. And it, it's a different kind of mindset. And the partnership has two courses on Community Action Academy. One is kind of an intro course and the other is a more advanced course. And I really encourage you, if you're considering uh, moving and shifting to a whole family approach, to have staff and managers look at those courses. They're, they're really uh, high quality, and I think they do a great job of helping people see the coaching mindset. So I, I think those are a great place to start for many of our folks on the line today. Thank you, Jeannie. Yeah, I think Jeannie hit on something really crucial. You know, we didn't talk much about the uh, continuums and some of the um, the organizational culture and structure, some of those things that really um, go into the, the some of the foundational elements of a two-gen whole family approach. It's really about shifting the paradigm and changing the way um, agencies view, um, you know, families and how how they interact with families, right? And so that, that's a shift in practice, which again, as Jeannie mentioned, the shift from, you know, management or uh, case management to more of that coaching and really acknowledging families as the experts in their own lives. That's, that's the real shift. They're really guiding the process and you're kind of facilitating them in that process. And so um, that's a, you know, a core, um, a core shift that generally happens um, so I also want to call out, you know, Virginia as, um, you know, a model, right? And so it's a pilot. Um, the next phase of, you know, two gen whole family is after you're, you've begun to kind of work on some of those process outcomes and those operational uh, and organizational culture and structure changes, then you kind of have your primed and ready to begin testing, right? So once you kind of, um, you know, it's referenced in the uh, Whole Family Approach Design Plan, but as you're getting clear on what the root cause is, what some of the solutions could be, who your target audience is or demographic is, demographic is, then you can you can begin to design solutions, right, or pilots to approach, um, you know, the issues that families may be facing. 
Um, and so what you learn from those pilots, uh, what you learn from those tests, would then inform what your longer term strategy is because the ultimate goal is to move from an approach to a way of doing business but you have to start somewhere so it starts in the mind it starts with testing and then based on what we learn from that test that then informs the way that we do business long term that's that's the north star I wonder if Amy, I see we had a question about how to access the coaching course. I wonder, Amy, if you could just give a little bit of intel about how easy it is to use Community Action Academy. Sure. Thank you, Jeannie. So um, as I put in the chat, it's free to access Community Action Academy on Moodle. Um, so if you click the link in the chat, it will, uh, once you log in and create your free account, it will take you to the Family Centered Coaching Courses. So there's an intro course and then also an advanced course. So it looks like, as people mentioned in the chat, some have taken those, but definitely check those out as they may be helpful to you. And if you have any trouble accessing, please feel free to let us know as well. What other questions are there? Is there anything that you'd like for us to go back to for a moment and maybe speak more about? Tiffany, I see that somebody put in, they were interested. This was in the beginning when we asked people what they might want to learn and somebody um, mentioned housing and two gen whole family approaches. And I will say that um, we have seen folks build their whole family to gen uh, around a housing platform. So if you do section eight, um, you might be able to work with families, you know, parents and children that are receiving that kind of assistance. Um, there are some great articles that have been out there from uh, put out by the Urban Institute and uh, Aspen Ascend about using a housing platform, uh, some kind of housing program or, or housing strategy to build your two gen whole family on. So there's stuff out there. If you can't find it or you'd like more about that, you know, send send Amy or myself, you know, an email and we can help you connect more on that. Yeah, and I, I think that that's a, a great point. And thank you, Jeannie. I think one thing that makes um, housing models like really attractive for two gen whole family is this idea of place-based, right? Place-based, um, family-centered, uh, to the extent that you can set up shop within a community um, or have access to, to someone who does, then you have a, a, a pretty solid and clear inroad uh, to being able to work with families uh, long-term. And so that is something to keep in mind um, when thinking about um, housing programs. Tiffany, could you talk a minute about the Aspen um, messaging guide? Because we have a question about communications, and I think that would be a great resource uh, for folks in that area. Absolutely. Thank you for raising that, Jeannie. So um, Ascend at the Aspen Institute actually partnered with the Frameworks Institute um, for years, I believe. Um, but in 2020, um, actually released a Frameworks uh, document, which uh, a messaging guide, which pretty much is it's research based. It's based on a few years of surveys, focus groups, as well as just, you know, other types of research to inform what messaging best resonates with certain groups of, of folks, especially around two gen whole family, right? So what we know is that two gen whole family is nonpartisan. It is about families. And so, you know, when you are, um, speaking to different stakeholder groups, it's very important to be mindful of messaging to use and messaging to avoid, right? So one, we wanna make sure we're you know, avoiding the myths. Uh, believe it or not, research shows that repeating a myth to someone, even if you follow it up with a fact like three times, they still remember the myth, right? And so that's research-based, evidence-based. And so what this messaging guide does is it gives tips about how to frame what Tujin whole family is with different stakeholder groups so that you can, you know, really um, build that buy-in um, and build the political will or whatever is needed to really advance this work. 
Um, you know, because again, it's nonpartisan. It doesn't matter, you know, where you sit. It doesn't matter if you're a frontline practitioner, if you're ever, uh, if you're an evaluator, a researcher, a legislator, what have you. It's good for families. So being able to clearly message that um, and, and build the will to advance it is critically important. We also have a question about engaging parents. And there are kind of two things that come to mind for me about that up, up at the front is that we, we really try to encourage folks and, and, and it is a guiding principle, engage families, uh, engage their voice, engage them in the planning. And, and that, that means that don't craft your two gen approach at the agency without families alongside that process, right? So the key to engaging families in the in the uh, service in 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 the in the support is engaging them in the planning, right? Like if they've been part of planning, if the approach really resonates for them, your uh, recruitment and engagement later will be easier because you will have crafted something that is very meaningful to families. So I think that's that's one. And that's the community action way, right? It's one of our community action ethics is um, to really listen and engage uh, people in the uh, in the design of community action strategies and services. Uh, and then that has to not just be at the beginning, it has to be all along the way. So continually checking in with families uh, and uh, having, a way and you know infrastructure and um, strategies for how they're going to continue to contribute uh, to the design and the tweaking and the advancement of the initiative is really important. So, so that's um, one way. And then, you know, we we've seen uh, folks who have started their uh, two gen work as sort of a pilot. In, you know, started small in their agency, maybe created a pilot, and and the families are really part of the the families that are in the pilot are part of figuring out what does it look like to scale. So, uh, I think that you know one of the keys to engaging parents, engaging families, is really respecting their voice and involving them, you know, all along the way. So my colleagues may have more to say about that, but that, that's sort of some of the initial things up front that, that, that we would want to flag. Yeah, thank you, Jeannie. I just want to double click and appreciate you, you know, mentioning or talking more about the family engagement piece and highlighting, you know, especially for community action agencies that offer Head Start, there's a parent policy council, right? That's a already built into the model. And so looking for ways to create those uh, formal and informal feedback loops with families, this goes beyond a customer satisfaction survey. You know, it's not that sort of engagement, right? We're talking meaningful, authentic engagement um, and really having families to be partners in the work, right? And so um, the other piece I wanted to hit on is that there was a question um, a very, you know, legitimate question or comment um, from Carlos Santana, um, which, you know, talks about some of the challenges that agencies face um, when trying to implement two-generation whole family approaches. And so, um, you know, it says to, to be completely um, family holistic in services is, you know, quite difficult, if not next to impossible. How long did it take this concept to be implemented and to be efficient? So what I will respond, what I will say to that is that it is non-linear, okay? And so agencies, you're right. Um, they may have tried it from using one approach and it may not have worked, but that is still part of the test, right? And so I think it's always about finding those um, inroads, finding those opportunities to integrate of finding those, as Jeannie mentioned, and you know, during her portion of the presentation, finding those partnerships and those agencies within the community to work more gener uh, generatively and collaboratively with other agencies, right? If you if it's something that may not be able to be resolved within your agencies, how can you co-create or co-design with other folks to be able to meet the needs of families? Because essentially. I mean, that's the North Star. What the families need is figuring out what's the roadmap to making sure families get that. I will say that one of the challenges 
not just with community action, but in the field in general and state systems and community-based systems, nonprofits, it's always gonna be around data and systems, especially in human services, because there are a lot of legacy systems, mainframe, green screens, you name it. That is a, it's a very touchy, um, you know, situation and, and area in terms of data sharing. So I think being clear about the types of data that can be shared, um, the, um, the real and perceived barriers, being clear about those, learning from others. I think that's why that field building piece is so important is because but this work has been done, it's being done, and it's being done by community action. Um, it's being done by state agencies, it's being done by nonprofits. And so I think finding models that have worked and learning from, from those lessons. Um, one thing that I will flag, um, you know, Peter and Amy mentioned the design briefs, right? So those design briefs actually highlight models of, of community action agencies that are implementing two gen whole family approaches, right? And so learning from one another is essential. Um, Ascend at the Aspen Institute also has case studies uh, they have a case study for the state of Maryland, which includes the work of Garrett County, uh, which is, of course, a leading edge, their leading edge whole family approach, um, you know, agency, um, have a lot of years in the game. Um, and also Colorado uh, is another model where you can kind of look at some of the lessons, um, you know, from, from their work um, in Tennessee as well. So I'll just pause there and hope that was helpful. If not, please feel free to follow up um, in the chat. So I think that one of the things that the comment about how hard this is really gets at is that, you know, change is hard and we in the human service field are often very driven and I say human service because it's not just a community action thing. We're driven by um, programs and grants and less driven by um, centering the work with uh, customers, whether it be you know, parents or children or families, and that everything kind of conspires against us. Our, our data systems, our financial systems, program reporting, all of that kind of conspires to keep us in those program lanes versus thinking in a very integrated way about what families need to advance. We all know intellectually that LIHEAP is probably not gonna get any family out of poverty, right? Like we we know it's gonna take Head Start and LIHEAP and some maybe some workforce training and some childcare. You know, it's a mix of things. And that, if you go back to the COGS, you know, the COGS are kind of a mix. And how do you bring those things together? And sometimes you can start by just doing you know, case planning together at the agency, or, you know, with, with some families and with um, some peers. That might be just, you know, a place to start. And it really ends up being about, you know, organizational change if you're going to sort of scale this. And that means that it takes leadership and commitment. And so one thing we haven't mentioned is that if your agency is in the process of doing strategic planning, which all community action agencies have to do at some point, your strategic planning process is a good time to think about, you know, how might we want to change our approach, maybe adopt a whole family approach or improve our service integration for parents and children. Um, you know, the, the strategic plan is a good time to think about that. So, you know, I, I encourage you if you're about to start or if you're in the middle of strategic planning, you know, to, to learn and think about whole family approach and, and how you might want to bake this approach in, in order to achieve better results for, for parents and children. And, and I want to sort of, as we're heading to the, the top of the hour, you know, all this approach is about is like achieving better results for parents and children than we would ever achieved before. And isn't that what we all want? Um, and especially in this moment, as we're coming out of the pandemic and, you know, there's really more trauma and more, um, you know, challenges for all of us, no matter our income level than we've ever seen you know, how do we help each other to do better? And whole family approach is one strategy. And, 
we really have um, tried to invest a lot in resources to help agencies adopt that particular strategy, but only adopt it if you're doing it to achieve better results for, for children and families, because that's, that's the why behind it. So with that, I'll, I'll hand it back to you, Tiffany, to park us uh, and, and, and bring us home. Thank you, Jeannie. Um, there's one question that we got in the q and I just want to hit on it really quick. And um, it's not a silly question, whoever you are. Um, but it says, you know, serving a lot of older adults whose kids no longer live with them. You know, how do you engage with them in generations? Um, you know, beyond. And so going back to that earlier point, it's really about working with the whole family as the family defines itself, which includes sometimes grandparent caregivers. We understand that, especially, um, you know, with Tana's child only cases, we know that family composition is different. And so it's really always about figuring out what the family needs. There is no cookie cutter way because it should always be tailored to meet the needs of the family. So if that includes, you know, older adult supports, whatever the case may be, um, and then to the extent that you run into barriers when trying to support older adults, figuring out what those barriers are, if they're tied to any regulation or policy, and being sure to surface those and advocate that they be changed, right? Because that's, that's the systems change part that goes with the practice piece. Because you guys are doing really great work sometimes, oftentimes, in spite of the many barriers um, related to, to regulations and, and policy and funding. All right. So I know we are running out of time. This has been a lot of fun and we could, we could talk about this forever. Um, so just know we will be following up with some additional resources, but um, I want to pass it. I want to thank you all uh, for your time and your energy and making this really interactive um, and pass it on to my colleagues, and Amy and Peter or I believe Peter, I apologize, uh, for one final um, question related to, you know, what are some additional resources that you would like to see developed in the future? Um, and then he'll, he'll send some or share some other next steps with you all as well. Thank you. Thanks, Tiffany. So yes, we'll do one last Menti question. We'd love to hear what you'd like to see for the future. So I'll just share my screen briefly. Hopefully the link works. All right, streamline strategic plan ideas. A good one. Anyone else have anything to add? Some things are coming in the chat. All right, well, thank you all for joining us. Well, we got how to utilize whole family approach families in, impacted by sexual abuse and human trafficking, initiating change from the bottom up. These are some great ideas. And I know some mentioned before wanting to see more on data, wanting to go into some of the homeworks a little more in depth. So those are very helpful. All right, so I'll pass it to Peter to close this out. Awesome, thank you very much. I'm just gonna share some contact information just so you can all contact us about this. So this is everyone's email at the partnership here. If you have an email with anybody else in the partnership though, feel free and they can put you in contact for us for more information on whole family approach. And then we will be sending out some slides and recordings uh, and resources to all of you who attended today. And we really appreciate you all coming out. Thank you very much.